Hello and welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I am Shriya. In today's episode, Taiwan's president leaves for a 10-day trip to Central America. We also talk about UN fact-finding missions report on human rights violations in Libya. And finally, a history is made in women's cricket as the inaugural edition of Women's Premier League comes to an end. On Wednesday, March 29, Taiwan's president leaves for an official visit to Central American countries of Guatemala and Belize with stopovers in the United States where she is expected to deliver a speech in New York. The Taiwanese president's visit comes at an interesting time and shortly after Honduras announced opening ties with China, ending the dip long diplomatic relationship between the two countries. Guatemala and Belize also happen to be the only Central American nations left which formally recognize Taiwan's sovereignty. Anish joins us now with latest updates on the story. Welcome back to this episode, Anish. Uh, glad to have you with us. So, why is this visit happening? Well, uh, at this point in time, Taiwan, uh, or you know, what it represents itself, which is the so-called uh, the Republic of China, uh, is fast losing allies uh, around the world. Uh, it has now, with the Honduras's exit and its uh, uh, it reverting its relationship back to uh, the People's Republic of China, which is you know the bigger one. Uh, uh, Taiwan is definitely just trying to a uh, you know keep its allies uh, intact and uh, and Guatemala and Belize the country that Tsai Ing-wen is going to visit uh, are the last of the 13 countries now left that still recognizes Taiwan as the Republic of China now uh, the issue is that uh, if it was just uh, you know Taiwan, uh, a Taiwanese president visiting one of these countries that still recognizes it, diplomatically speaking, uh, it would have been fine. Uh, it is something, but China's in issue here is the fact that it is happening with a transit in New York uh, on her way to these countries and uh, and a transit to uh, through Los Angeles on her way back to Taiwan. So in both cases, uh, there's definitely a you know, a significant amount of time uh, left uh, for her to make visits and uh, even meet uh, with officials in the United States. And that is a red line that China does not want uh, the Taiwanese president or the United States to cross. Now, there are already rumors about that uh, Tsai Ing-wen is uh, scheduled to meet with uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, the House Speaker of the U.S. Congress's House of Representatives, and, uh, and uh, it might happen in Los Angeles or her transit through Los Angeles, so-called transit. So this is definitely something that is going to raise alarm bells because, for one, uh, this is not just some uh, you know uh, belligerent uh, two belligerent nations uh, uh, vying for influence. This is a uh, this is a matter of basically sovereignty over Taiwan and over the rest of China as well. Uh, as far as China sees, it is uh, its territory. Uh, is the same is uh, true for Taiwan, which uh, through its constitution claims the whole of China for itself. So in both the cases, if you abide by the one China policy, you are recognizing sovereignty of one over the other as well by default. But the United States is not ready to go through that and is making these provocative uh, moves that is going to only heighten tensions in the region. Right, Anish, and you mentioned also about the significance of the, you know, the U.S. stopovers and what, how is it likely to change the relationship uh, that Taiwan and U.S. have shared so far? I mean, there is a lot changing in the region. Will this relationship also change? It is very difficult to say what the United States intends to do uh, with Taiwan. Uh, obviously, we have seen over the past few years uh, under the uh, Trump administration, now uh, continued under the Biden administration, the U.S. state uh, machinery, the foreign policy machinery has taken this sort of a stand uh, whereby it is trying to pretend that Taiwan is some kind of an independent nation uh, in and by itself. And that uh, it has uh, and obviously we have also seen recent uh, legislations being passed by the u.s congress 
that uh, will necessitate any kind of U.S. intervention, mil even military intervention, in case uh, there is an armed conflict uh, break, uh, in case an armed conflict breaks out between U.S. And, sorry, China and Taiwan. So uh, obviously, there they are trying to change this relationship, but to what end is quite unsure. Uh, obviously, uh, the U.S. officials uh, are not forthcoming about what they think about Taiwan. Uh, they're not very clear if they uh, support any kind of an independent or a, uh, independent Taiwan as certain uh, reactionary groups in Taiwan would like to uh, go for, or it thinks that Taiwan's, uh, the so-called Republic of China is the true representative of the whole of China. So these factors need to be spelled out, but the U.S. is refusing to do so uh, in the kind of... Uh, and especially important because uh, at, at a time of such brinkmanship, if you're going to fight for a cause, it has to be a very uh, clearly defined one. But in the case of Taiwan, there is nothing of that sort. So the relations we have, uh, whether it is going to change any kind of uh, you know relations between uh, U.S. and Taiwan and by extension China, we have to wait and see. We have to see if uh, Kevin McCarthy is, uh, you know, is going to meet with Tsai Ing-wen to begin with. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, obviously, uh, there is it's a different thing. But if it does happen, we are going to see a very, uh, you know, spiraling case of tensions in the region, and we do not know what what is going to be, uh, you know, at store uh, in the coming days. Right. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode, Anish. The UN-appointed Independent Fact-Finding Mission in Libya released a report on Monday, March 27, on the human rights violations that have taken place in the country since 2016. According to investigators, the European Union and its member countries have provided monetary and material aid to Libyan authorities and armed militias that have been responsible for widespread human rights violations, including war crimes and crimes against humanity. We are now joined by Abdul from People's Dispatch, who has more details on this story. Welcome to this episode, Abdul. Uh, first off, can you tell us what are the details of this UN report? The report basically uh, has uh, is quite detailed in in the fact that they have the cl it claims that more than 100 uh, victims and the witnesses have been in interviewed, and uh, uh, it also had talked with different officials on the ground. And uh, with that, uh, the report talks about various parts of uh, human rights violations, various kinds of human rights violations in Libya. Uh, it's, it says that uh, the Libyan authorities have been involved in uh, arbitrary detention, torture, murder, uh, rape, even sexual uh, slavery for women. Uh, and most of these things are, are, are primarily uh, related to the treatment of the migrants. Uh, as uh, it is well known now that how uh, Libya has become a kind of a transit point uh, for uh, dif uh, people from different parts of the world coming there in order to kind of migrate further to European uh, countries. And this is primarily because of the, uh, the chaos and anarchy which has been created because of the NATO-led inv invasion in 2011. So uh, since then, uh, uh, there is a systematic, you can say, uh, uh, there, there, is, there has been no system, report indicates that there has been no system in place in Libya, which basically uh, can implement rule of law. So, because of the absence of rule of law, uh, uh, absence of authority, centralized uh, authorities which have influence all over Libya, uh, there are regional forces and all the regional forces uh, uh, have basically used their military power to uh, make uh, 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 basically oppress whatever dissent uh, is emerging in Libya and to make money out of the migra migration uh, uh, crisis. So this is uh, the primary finding of the report and it basically talks about how uh, the detention centers for migrants in particular are have been the primary uh, space where uh, different kinds of human rights violations are happening. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, in Tripoli, even in Tripoli, capital Tripoli, uh, uh, there were reports about how uh, uh, the conditions uh, <clears throat> migrations are kept in 
are really bad. There is no food, uh, enough food available for them. There is no sanitation. Uh, overcrowded uh, uh, sales cells are there in which uh, uh, most of, uh, in sometimes migrants are, uh, there are reports of migrants dying hmm. because of suffocation, because of starvation, because of the health related issues. So the report basically uh, clubs all these findings in last five or six years and uh, says that the Libyan authorities have been responsible for war crimes and uh, uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, so it is basically, it take, talks about the severity of a uh, uh, law and order situation in, in, in Libya and uh, talks about how it can be improved as well. Right, and Abdul, there's also an element in the report about the European Union's complicity. Can you tell us what is that about? Well, that is the most important part of the uh, report. Uh, the, as, uh, as I said earlier, that Libya has become a kind of hub for uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, where people from different parts of the world are brought in uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with promises hmm. that they will be, uh, there, there will be a facilitation of their further migration into European Union. Given the fact that most of the countries in Africa and in Asia are suffering from economic crisis, from uh, wars of different kinds, most of these wars are the results of the imperialist interventions, particularly in Africa. Uh, so people are trying to uh, uh, find better ways of living. Uh, that particular condition is exploited by the human traffickers and a large number of people are brought in, uh, in Libya. The report says that in within one year, one year uh, from last March till this, last April till this March, uh, uh, means uh, uh, April 2022, till March 2023, they found that around uh, 400,000 uh, uh, such migrants were uh, available, uh, uh, were present in Libya. So it says the scale, the wide, wide scale uh, at which this particular thing is happening. But Europeans have a very strict uh, border control laws. They have invested heavily in, uh, in their uh, Frontex, which basically controls the movement of migrants through the sea. And they also provide a lot of money to Libyan authorities mm -hmm. to uh, prevent uh, any attempt uh, of sea crossing, which basically leads to a, a large number of deaths uh, in sea because uh, boats are boats which carry the migrants across the Mediterranean Sea are stranded there. Uh, sometimes they are overcrowded and therefore they are drawn, they, uh, um, uh, they uh, sink in the sea and so on and so forth. So uh, every year thousands of uh, migrants die in this uh, because of the European border control policies and their uh, funding to uh, uh, the Libyan authorities. The report also says that the, the detention centers in, uh, in, in Libya, different parts of Libya, uh, basically and the, uh, uh, the forces which, are, which basically maintain uh, these detention centers are funded by uh, uh, European uh, uh, countries. They are also provided weapons and boats and other uh, equipments to control the movement of people into the sea. It means in direct or indirect way, European Union and the country, uh, European countries have been involved uh, with the Libyan authorities knowing very well that these uh, Libyan authorities are involved in uh, uh, heinous uh, uh, criminal activities uh, uh, and uh, in violations of human rights of people. Despite knowing that, they have been basically uh, 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 continued, they have continued their financial support and support through the equipment uh, to Libyan authorities. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Abdul. In our final story of this episode, a landmark development takes place in the world of women's cricket. The inaugural edition of Women's Premier League concluded on Sunday, March 26, heralding a new beginning for the game and its players. Senior journalist Sharda Ugra now joins us for the story. Glad to have you with us for this very special episode, uh, Sharda. And uh, my first question is that uh, this is the biggest cricket league in terms of the audience, or audience re receptance, and uh, and it's been taking place in other countries. For example, for example, US, Australia. Uh, but it took a lot of time for a women's version of the Indian Premier League to launch here in India. Uh, what is the context and why did it take for such a long time? 
um it's very difficult to give in an official answer to why it took a long time it just tended to be a little bit of uh, sort of uh, sluggishness on the part of the administrators uh, they will say that look there was a court case that was going on and therefore we couldn't get things into motion but they did manage to hold the ipl regardless of court cases and so on um so there there has always been uh, from the bcci the, until about say 2013 2014 there had always been a little bit of um lack of interest in the women's game uh, after 2013 2014 you see that the contracts have been introduced from the first time you have women's academies that are functioning you you get to know about them um but uh, uh, this whole league happened this is my theory it is based on nothing but just a journalist mind at the moment the pakistan cricket board announced that they are going to start a pakistan super league for the women uh i think there became a little bit of uh, answer, uh, unease and 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 almost uh, urgency on the part of the bcci to say listen we need to get the ipl started there had always been interest in it from uh, uh, franchises in the ipl that wanted to have women's teams uh, they they held this uh, women's challenge uh, three four matches per you know for the last two three seasons just almost like cursory little bit of uh, 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 what shall we call it breadcrumbs uh which even the women were very happy to uh, take part in and just uh, share the experience so when this actually began uh, if you look at it uh, it literally took a couple of months for everything to happen very quickly one after the other uh, they said they are going to announce it they, they released the franchises uh, they got the media rights they announced the franchises that were there they did the bidding they got the sponsors and the tournament was done in 3 weeks so look at the speed with which it's happened and you're thinking that if it could, if this could be done so quickly now why not earlier you know right and for a first tournament can you also highlight for us what were some of the positives uh, that can be positive takeaways from this first tournament and how are they likely to shape the game in the coming future uh i think the first tournament the biggest uh, takeaway for the women's game is the fact that they had uh, people come to watch and take interest in and follow on television we are not sure what the exact numbers are i mean uh, some numbers have been shared they've said 50 million um you know you don't know whether that's a combined viewership or what it is uh, but incredible numbers incredible popularity in the sense of the fact that people are coming to the stadium they'll say oh that's because the tickets are free but ticket buying in india is such a complicated for for a cricket match is such a complicated experience that when it was sort of streamlined you look at the way people turned up to watch um uh, the, the support from uh, the mumbai fans was incredible uh, uh, th that that was the big uh, the the quality of the cricket that we saw was also excellent there were a lot of women involved in the game itself you had umpires match ref the match referees that were there uh, so there was it was almost a women's ecosystem was working uh alongside the 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 bcci's uh, uh male sort of working system and another thing it showed you uh, you know shreyas that um look at the quality of the turnaround with which you are able to do this event it's something it's not easy to do it even though they had restricted it to two cities and uh, sorry to one city two venues and three weeks i mean they still managed to pull it off and 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 fairly fairly uh, smoothly so those are the big ones very interesting on uh, to watch on television the kind of advertising that it generated you had ads that were specifically targeted almost they're featuring women that were there um whether it was about sunscreen whether they had cars whether they had things about uh, jewelry gold big ads from the gold council so an interesting stream of ads which shows you that there is another parallel market for a uh, uh, women's sport you know and it doesn't have to be uh, something unlike what happens in i mean that's different i mean it could be different in terms of uh, a material uh, uh, what is in front of you but it, it it's not any less um what will always happen now will be the comparison oh look at the men's ipl it's crazy it's crazy but it's been going for 15 years and why the women's ipl could have been started earlier we have no idea if the women would not have made the 2017 uh, final of the 50 over world cup in um, england i don't think any of this would have happened but i think that, that has been a, a one catalyst that just sort of set things in in, in motion a really good really good outcomes some really good performances some sort of not so great performances from particularly star indians but a really good feel good about this event uh, all you know pretty much all around right uh, thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for your time yeah
And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep following peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.